In this series, we will look at the Safavid and Mughal empires, two empires forged from the iron will of two young boy rulers who would be thrown together initially by circumstance against a common enemy, to each carve out an imperial niche for themselves. This is the story of Ismail and Babur, respective founders of the Safavid and Mughal empires. The seeds for two of the three great Middle Eastern gunpowder empires, the Safavid and Mughal empires, begins with the birth of two boys at the end of the 15th century, Babur, then known as Zahiruddin Muhammad, and Ismail. Both lost their fathers at a very early age. Both had a mixed Persian and Turco-Mongolian upbringing. Both were warrior poets, and both would carve out empires for themselves. But the genesis for the seeds, well, that goes back even further still. From 1206 to 1368 in the Common Era, the unified Mongolian tribes under Chinggis Khan and his heirs spread across Asia into Europe, forming the Mongolian Empire, the largest land empire to have ever existed on the planet. The various fragments of this once great empire would carve out identities for themselves, first as Khanates, then as various kingdoms and empires in their own right. One of these Mongolian Empire offshoots was the Timurid Empire in Persia and Central Asia. It was for most of the 1300s ruled by Timur, who was of Turco-Mongolian descent. In the remnants of this empire, the two boys were born. A descendant of Timur, Babur, which meant tiger in Persian, was born in 1483 in what is now Uzbekistan. Ismail was born in 1487 in Ardabil, an ancient city in the northwest of the region. The Persians, who had left Zoroastrianism with but a few exceptions, now embraced Islam. But it would be their language, the Persian language and not Arabic, that would hold sway as the primary language of administration and art in the areas around what was Persia. The Timurid and future Safavid and Mughal empires would all embrace Persian as the language of their empires. Persian poetic epics like the Shahnameh, known as the Book of Kings, not only influenced literature within Persia, but was celebrated in nearby regions as well. Persian itself not only continues to exist in varying forms outside of Iran, but fused with lingua francas of the region and the day to develop into languages like Urdu. Although Babur was fluent in the Persian language of the Timurid Empire, his mother tongue was Chagatai Turkic. And much of the information we have is thanks to Babur himself, for he wrote one of the earliest autobiographies known. Thanks to this book, we know his childhood was one rarely free of conflict. Not just external, but conflict within his own family. When he was just 11, his father died feeding pigeons when the poorly constructed aviary he was in toppled into a ravine below. Two of his uncles from neighboring kingdoms coveted his throne and continually attempted to dislodge him from it. With some good fortune though and the aid of his maternal grandmother, he managed to cling on to that throne. At just 15 years of age, he laid siege to Samarkand and captured it after seven grueling months. However, those early years would see him capture territory, only to lose it shortly after. He captured and lost Samarkand twice before finally being forced into exile. He stayed in Tashkent, which was under the rule of his maternal uncle, and endured, according to his autobiography, much poverty and much humiliation. No country and no hope of one, he would write. However, Babur did not stay idle during his three years of exile. He put his sole focus and all of his efforts into building a strong army. But he had to resign himself to looking south instead. In the south is also where Babur's fortunes would begin to shift favorably. Kabul, which was then ruled by Ulug Beg Mirza of the Argum dynasty, whose heir was but an infant. He died 
and an usurper, Mukenbeg, took the infant's throne. Mukin was unpopular with the local population, which again favored Babur. Babur crossed the blizzard-prone mountains of the Hindu Kush and captured Kabul to again have a kingdom of his own. With his fortunes shifting for the better in the south, he began to look even further in that direction and east towards Hindustan, present northern-day India and Pakistan. However, his kingship did not come without price. He had entered into an agreement with Ismail, the Shah of Safavid Persia. Ismail was born the last in a line of hereditary grandmasters of the Safaviya Sufi order. At the age of just seven, his father was killed in a battle at Tabasaran, fighting the combined forces of Shervan Shah Farooq Yassar and his overlord, the Akkoyunlu, a Turkic tribal federation that controlled most of what was the heartland of Persia. This forced young Ismail and his followers into hiding, where he received education under the guidance of numerous scholars. At the age of 12, he returned to the land of his birth, along with his followers. Ismail sent out an invite to several Kizilbash tribes of the region for support in early 1500. The Kizilbash, or Redheads, were made up of roughly nine Turkoman tribes. And that summer, 7,000 Kizilbash troops would heed Ismail's call. And that winter, they would pass over the Kura River and march towards the Shivan Shah's state. There, they defeated Shervan Shah Farooq Yassar's forces near Kabani or Gulistan, avenging Ismail's father's death. And then they went on to conquer Baku. Ismail now controlled Shervan, the area roughly corresponding to present-day Azerbaijan and southern Dagestan. These lands would, for the first few years, continue to be ruled by the Shervan Shah's line, but under Safavid overlordship. Ismail's successful conquest of the region, however, did not go unnoticed. Alvind, the ruler of the Aitkayunlu, brought an army north from Tabriz and crossed the Aras River to engage the Safavid forces. A battle was fought at Sarur, and despite being outnumbered four to one, Ismail's army won the battle decisively. Some months earlier, Ismail had made pacts with Georgian King Constantine II and Alexander I, King of Kartli and Kakheti, to attack the Ottoman holdings near Tabriz. In return, he would cancel the tribute Constantine had to pay the Akkoyunlu once Tabriz was captured. However, Ismail broke his promise, and instead, he made both Kartli and Kakheti vassal states of his. In July of 1501, Ismail was proclaimed Shah of Azerbaijan with Tabriz as his capital. His former guardian and current mentor Hussein Beg Shamlu was made commander-in-chief of the Kizilbash army and his vakil or vice garant. The army consisted mainly of tribal units, Turkmen from Anatolia and Syria, Kurds, as well as some other smaller tribes people. After being made Shah, he instated Twelver Shiism, as the compulsory religion of his now growing empire. In 1502, after defeating an Akkayunlu army, he took the title of Shah of Iran. The years after this would see Ismail conquer additional territory. Erzincan and Erzurum in 1502, and then in 1503, Dayat and Fars, in 1504, Mazandaran, Gorgon and Yaz, in 1507, Dayak Bakir was conquered, and it was also the year he would begin to shift the power base of the high ranking around him to consist of more Persians. The reasons for this are said to stem from his belief that the Kizilbash had already been given too much power, and he felt they were no longer as trustworthy. In 1508, Ismail would force the rulers of Khuzestan, Loristan, and Kurdistan to become vassal kingdoms of his empire. It was also the year in which he would seize Baghdad and put an end to the Akkayunlu. The darker side of this, however, was his destruction of Sunni sites in the city, including tombs of caliphs and imams. 
In the next episode, the once orphans, Babur and Ismail, now grown men with imperial ambitions, unite against a common foe.